Good afternoon, my friends, the doctors in the house. Happy Wednesday, and welcome back to another episode of To Your Health with Dr. G. My name is Dr. Mark Gomez. I'm a board-certified internal medicine physician practicing at Edward Hospital in Naperville. Hey, it's so great to have you back here. Again, we're all about building trust and delivering truth on the show, and today is no exception. I'm excited to be talking about stroke. Today's show is entitled Stroke 101. You're listening to us here live on Facebook. We're in studio here at Intellectual Radios. Check me out on my website at www.drmarkgomez.com. I'm so excited to bring back the dream team as a column. Um, my guests today are fierce, and you'll meet them again in a moment. They've been on the show before. I had to get them back because we're talking about the importance of stroke, that it can affect all of us. It touches all of us. We all probably know somebody who's been afflicted by this serious condition. So we're going to talk about it. Again, we're all about making sure that you have the tools to be successful with your health. And at the end of the day, when you have success in your health, you're more than likely to have opportunity for success in your life. And we're all about bringing that to you here again today. So I'm so excited. It's Wednesday, and we're going to be talking stroke, y'all. But before we get into stroke, I want to hit you guys with a quick disclaimer. The content of To Your Health with Dr. G is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and that the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, and or treatment. Further details can be found at www.toyourhealthwithdrg.com slash disclaimer. So here we are. It's May. It's National Stroke Awareness Month. And really what we want to do today, after we talk about stroke today and make sure that you have the tools to understand this condition, at the end of the day, we cannot let this conversation stop today. We have to keep this conversation going on, and it's got to be an everyday conversation because stroke is real. You're going to hear from me and my experts today talking about the impact that it can have on people's lives everywhere. And we're going to talk about what can you do to reduce your risk of getting a stroke. And lastly, we're going to talk about my lovely segment, Myths versus Facts. Can I have a show of Two Your Health with Dr. G without setting the record straight? Again, we want people to have the right information from my, sort, from my certified, my, my trained clinicians and what they do each and every day. And again, the gentlemen today on the show, they're back here today and they're going to continue to bring the message for you. I try to surround myself with the right experts that are leaders in their field and their craft, and we're trying to make sure you guys have the right information to forge ahead on your health plan. So again, I'm excited to welcome everybody back. So my crew today, they are fierce. And my crew that's on the show today, you met them back in October when we did a concussion show. So I had to have them back because of the Dream Team. We all know each other. Uh, um, Dr. McCoy and I, you'll meet him. Uh, went to medical school, you'll meet him in a few moments. Dr. Spencer and I worked together at the hospital. So it's just a great relationship again friends and colleagues helping you out to make sure you have the right tools for success. So without further ado, I want to introduce my colleagues, my panel today. Their credentials are fierce. So I want to welcome first my guest. I'm going to read his information. Dr. Matthew McCoy. He's a board certified neurologist, associate professor and, and residency program director, neurology at Loyola Medicine. Check him out at www.loyolamedicine.org. Dr. McCoy, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here again. Hey, please tell us again about your background, where you did your medical school, your training, et cetera. Yeah, so my, my medical school training was at Loyola Medical Center just down the street. I did my uh, residency and fellowship training at University of Chicago down on the, the south side, and then went back uh, to Loyola. And I've been on staff for 10 years as a staff neurologist, uh, just finishing my 10th year. Uh, and I also get to be involved with the medical school, doing the neuroscience course, as well as running the neurology residency training program. I tell you what, we've known each other for a long time because Dr. McCoy and I were classmates at Loyola, so it's just so funny how I feel like we're older, yeah. but hopefully wiser at the same time. There's no doubt sure. about that. But I thank you very much, Dr. Sure. McCoy, for coming out again on the show today to help support this mission on creating health, awareness, and engagement everywhere. So thank you again. Can't wait to talk more about stroke. And then my next guest, he and I work together at Edward Hospital good friend and colleague of mine. He's taken care of a lot of my patients over the years. So I want to welcome him back to the show, Dr. Drew Spencer. He's a board eligible neurosurgeon, Edward Elmer's Health. Check him out, www.eehealth.org. Dr. Spencer, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Hey, you bet. Please tell us again where you did your medical school, where you did your training as well, too. I did my medical school at SIU in Springfield, Illinois, and then I came back, did my residency part of time at Loyola, and then finished up at Northwestern. And now I'm practicing, as you know, at Edward Hospital under Northwestern Medical Group. Excellent. So I want to ask you this, because you guys are involved in stroke on an intimate basis. I mean, Dr. Dr. McCoy, what you do with the neurology program, and Dr. Spencer, what you do with the neurosurgery program. You know, let me ask you this, Dr. McCoy. You know, when you think about stroke, what's kind of like, what's kind of like the opening theme that comes to your mind right away when you think about stroke? 
Yeah, so the biggest thing that I would emphasize with stroke uh, is, is patient awareness, because this is a very time-sensitive issue. Uh, you know, we've, we've done a great job in the medical community stressing the importance of cardiac care. If you have chest pain, for example, that really needs to be checked out emergently. Uh, to me, stroke is just as essential. We, we have a very limited time window where we have a number of very effective treatments for patients, but only if they're able to present to medical care facilities at the right period of time. Thank you. You know, Dr. Spencer, why don't you give us a few opening, opening comments about your take on when you hear the word stroke, as a clinician, what does that mean to you and for patients to understand? Yeah, honestly, Mark, I see some of the worst cases, so what comes to mind for me is really just it's a devastating disease process. And the two things that come to mind for me are education and prevention, because I think those are our two most effective interventions that we'll be able to use. So, so let me ask this question. How common, I'm going to ask this question, Dr. McCoy, but how common is stroke? From what I gather, it's the, it's the fifth leading cause of death in this country. Uh, but, but, but does stroke discriminate at all? Uh, no. Anyone is at risk of stroke. We certainly see it in patients uh, who are older in age, who have cardiovascular risk factors, things like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, history of cigarette use. But in theory, anyone is at risk of stroke. We do see stroke in younger patients because they have risk factors like blood clotting disorders, uh, pregnant women, sometimes related to things like trauma. Um, I can tell you it, it is the most common reason for neurologic admission. If you go to any of the major teaching hospitals, if you go to Edward Hospital, uh, and there's a neurology service, the number one admission will be for stroke. Wow. You know, Do Dr. Spencer, here we are in May, um, National Stroke Awareness Month, and we're trying to engage the public in um, really knowing and learning more about stroke. You know, how do you kind of see our outreach? What, what are things that we should be doing as clinicians to better educate? You know, some of the old kind of saying I would say is like, you know, the old days, you, when you want to tell somebody something, you got to get up in their face and get them to pay attention. But how are we broadcasting that message from your perspective? I think as clinicians, you know, we have the opportunity to have that face-to-face -face or in-your-face interaction with people, but I think we have to keep up with the, the most common forms of media right now. I think what you're doing with this show here, and I think we have to look at right next to that app on your phone, is the Facebook, everything else, and I think we have to use those. Those are easy, low-cost ways to advertise this, and everybody uses it. Excellent. You know, you know, Dr. McCoy, I want to get your position, because you're teaching residents, when you're teaching them to care for patients, of course. Uh, and, and as you continue to care for patients yourself, you know, what's your kind of think of like, why should the public, we're out here today having this conversation, but why should people care about stroke? Yeah, so I, you know, I just got back from Philadelphia, so I feel like this is probably something Ben Franklin said, you know, an, ounce of, an, an ounce of prevention. Um, as Dr. Spencer mentioned, stroke can be an absolutely devastating condition. Uh, people can die as a result of stroke or can certainly be neurologically devastated. It can take away somebody's ability to speak, to see, to listen. It can be absolutely devastating. As a neurologist, um, my hope is that you never meet me, right? Because the, the preventing stroke by working with your primary care physician, by healthy uh, lifestyle habits, much better off if we can prevent stroke through really healthy decisions rather than meeting me after the fact, where the best I can do as a neurologist is hope that I can limit the damage and help you get to recovery. If we could have avoided that by, by modifying some risk factors, mm -hmm. you'd be in much, someone would be in a much better place. I was just at a, I was telling you guys off air, I was just at a conference in Boston a few weeks ago, and my, my wife and I went, and it was a lifestyle medicine conference, and what we were talking about was really just kind of centering, getting back to kind of our roots. We all talk about prevention, but we actually have to do it. And there's a difference between obviously talking the talk and walking the walk. And when it comes to my perspective from stroke, it's like your foundation, as you both, as you both mentioned, working with your primary care physician is huge. And you can't underscore that any more than that. And I always kind of say it like this. When I got from one of the things I got from the conference, they, uh, one of the presenters would say, move more, eat better, and stress less. And when you think about, about what we do is, is we don't move as much as we probably should, and we don't eat as well as we should. And, of course, we live in a very high-stress environment uh, and different communities in this country. So it's already an uphill battle. But we've got to figure out how can we turn the, turn the tide to now lead this to not making this an issue. And I love how you just said it. You're like, I don't get offended if somebody doesn't see me in my practice because, hey, you prevented uh, coming in with a devastating, potentially devastating permanent neurological deficit. I think that's just found, this is phenomenal. So I want to ask this, this, this question. Well, I'm going to ask this question to Dr. Spencer. You know, we're, we're talking about lifestyle. And, of course, from your perspective as a neurosurgeon, you know, the, you know I usually say when somebody comes and calls you involved in a stroke, you know, that's, a, that's some pretty heavy stuff that's going down. Um, but before we get into, like, what you specifically do, what's your, just talk, what's your just thought about lifestyle? What are some other things that people should be doing to help minimize their risk for stroke? 
I think you already previewed this with your three very simple statements, Mark. I think we have to go back to doing doing those things. But I think it's really being aware. I think it's making sure you hold yourself accountable with your primary care physician, knowing, being self-aware. Overweight obesity is a huge problem here. Uh, diabetes has been more and more prevalent. Simple things like blood pressure, uh, heart. A, anybody that has an abnormal heart rhythm, AFib, smoking is one of the things that still to this day, despite the education, is really prevalent in our society and it puts you at a huge risk. And I think people just have to be honest with themselves in limiting some of the simpler risk factors. The three things you said are some of the yeah. easiest things we can do. I'll say that again, again. Uh, move more. Uh, what was I saying? Or eat better and then stress less. There's no doubt about that. I almost forgot my own phrase right there. But uh, but here's the deal. You know, uh, some of the statistics that I got from the CDC, and this is why we want to hit the point, hit the hit home the importance of stroke. Um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, that it's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States, according to the CDC, and that was published in 2007. 2017 is based on 2016 data. And interesting thing that I found, each year nearly 800,000 people in this country experience a stroke, and that's one every 40 seconds. So as long as we've been on right now, there have been people out there that have had strokes, uh, multiple stroke victims while we're talking, and this is the more important thing why we have to create that urgency. Because if we don't create urgency, then we're never going to get action, we're never going to get measurable change. And then the reality is this, uh, from some of my research on this one, I want to ask Dr. McCoy, um, I read this thing when you talk about 800,000 Americans getting strokes each year. Uh, we know that the, the overwhelming majority of them do not die from their, from their stroke. You know, we know stroke is, a, is one of the top ten leading causes of death. Uh, talk a little bit more about the, the devastating impact that it can have that it can leave with somebody if they have a stroke. Yeah, stroke. Yeah, absolutely. So the, to me, with stroke, brain is real estate. Uh, so you can have a, a stroke that is small in size but critical in location. Um, so if someone has a stroke, for example, in the inner core of the brain, a brainstem, the symptoms they can have can be profound. So from a small stroke, someone may have complete weakness of the face, arm, and leg. They, uh, if it affects eloquent parts of the brain structure, they may not be able to speak again or understand language. So it, it, in, in, in neuroanatomy and in neurology as well as surgery, it's not so much the size of the stroke that's really critical, it's the location of the stroke. So we'll commonly have patients come in and say, you know, a family member had a stroke and it must have been a large stroke because the symptoms were devastating. No, the stroke itself may have been small, it was just in an anatomically eloquent place, and the results of that can be profound and lifelong. Talk about, well, I'm going to ask this question right back at you. Talk about this acronym, this FAST acronym. I did a video prior to the show uh, that you guys saw on social media, and I said FAST, and it's the acronym that we're using now. Can you break that down for us? Yep, so there, there are critical things that we try to tell a lot of patients. A lot of our um, educational material for patients and families includes the FAST acronym, so face, arm, speech, time. Uh, oftentimes in stroke, there can be facial weakness, there can be um, arm weakness, where you, someone can't hold their arm up, for example. Um, there can be difficulty with speech, either the words are slurred or they have difficulty producing language. And the last piece is really critical, what time did the symptoms start? Our neurology residents and medical students are trained, when a patient comes to the emergency room, one of the first pieces of information we want is what time did the symptoms start? That is absolutely essential to anything that we can offer as neurosurgery or neurology. Uh, is we really need to know what time it started because that is going to have a, a significant impact on what treatments we can employ. Well, you know, Dr. Spencer, as a neurosurgeon, you know, again, you get uh, alluded to this earlier, but you get called in <clears throat> and you may see some devastating effects of stroke or bleeding. Um, talk about a little bit of the role of the neurosurgeon when it comes to stroke. I think some people uh, uh, understand certainly the role where neurologists may come in, but talk about the role of what you do. Sure. And you did unfortunately touch on some of it that we see some of the worst of the worst. We see some of the cases where you know, the reaction of, brain, of the brain to stroke involves, it can involve bleeding into the brain tissue. It can be devastating. That usually irreparably damages some brain tissue, whereas if we catch it before that, there are some interventions now that can save brain tissue. Uh, the brain can swell, and that's the, the most likely thing when we see the traditional ischemic or lack of blood flow type of strokes, when the brain swells out of proportion to what you can tolerate. You know, our heads are unfortunately a bony box, so there's only you know, so much space there. And when that becomes the case, those are usually the ones that I'm called for, and those are the things where time is certainly of the essence, even maybe not as much so as the interventions we can do to reverse the effects, but certainly if there's any function or if somebody comes a life-saving measure, that's really important from my perspective. Thank you for giving some more clarity on that, that, that issue. Uh, let me ask this question to Dr. Dr. McCoy. Go back to this fast acronym. You know, you, and both of you guys are really talking about time. And now, actually, I opened this question to both of you guys. We both are talking about time. <clears throat> Obviously, the first thing I always kind of tell, tell my patients, and I try to do some education from a primary care perspective uh, about your risk factors and saying if we don't control these risk factors, this might happen. But um, <clears throat> I always talk about, like, 
hey, you know, if something happens, there's no, there's, no, there's like no such thing as crying wolf when it comes to like your health. And so I say, if something's happening, you observe something, immediately call 911. Uh, and that's the best thing, you know, we all walk around with our cell phones on us, we have, have devices on us. So if you see something, I tell people, call 911. You know, the best news we can tell you is that nothing, you know, as, after you can properly assess that nothing's going on. But talk about like the, like, like the fact, the delay, if we have that delay or, or you know, what's going to happen if, that, if we don't activate EMS right away? So from a stroke standpoint, uh, there's a few specific treatments to reverse a stroke. Right? Our number one goal is to prevent stroke, the things you, you've touched on, reducing risk factors like high blood pressure, cigarette use. Uh, but say someone has a stroke, we have in the range of maybe three to six hours. There's a little room with, in, around that, but about three to six hours to really make an intervention. Um, the biggest thing we need is we need people in the hospital. We need them in the emergency room uh, so we can respond appropriately. Uh, it, it, the, maybe the biggest mistake we'll see people make is they develop symptoms, they recognize something is wrong, and they say, well, let me wait and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll go to bed and I'll see if it's still present in the morning. You know, at that time, uh, many, many of the acute interventions we have are gone. Going back to heart attack, I think we've, we've done a great job with education in the community. You have chest pain, just come in, we'll try to sort it out. We'd rather see you now than hours down the road. Uh, for stroke, I think we really need the same emphasis. It's, if folks say, well, you know, my, my speech is slurred, my face looks asymmetric, but you know, let me see what happens a few hours from now. Uh, maybe I'll call my primary care doc tomorrow. Well, that was maybe our one chance to make an intervention. Wow. We even see some communities where the ambulances are now equipped with, the, with CT scanners and the inter ability to provide these medications right in the field before they even come to the emergency room. So time is absolutely of the essence for this diagnosis. Well, and Dr. Spencer, when, you, when you're thinking about, uh, again, time, and I think that's one of the g biggest things that we think about, even though we have the acronym FAST, you know, time, 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 it comes everything because, you know, we want, we, we, certainly you want to make an intervention and you want to preserve as much brain function as possible. And so, you know, I want, people come in, and I want to kind of lay this out for people here, um, so say somebody comes to the hospital, you know, they're, they're assessed right away from the emergency room physician. What happens next from your perspective? You know, what can people understand what the process may be so that if the, for somebody they are in that situation or loved ones in that situation, they have a better understanding of what to expect? I would say the number one expectation is things always take longer than you expect in the hospital. <laughs> we move as fast as we possibly can, but it does take some time. So we make that initial assessment. We have tools that help us assess what you might be having and what we do next. They usually involve some basic lab work. They involve inevitably some scan of your head, whether, whether it be a C, plain CT scan, a CT where they inject dye to look at the blood vessels of your brain, the arteries, the veins, and then usually moves on to an MRI if there's a higher suspicion of stroke, which gives us finer detail and can catch it much earlier. CT scan can tell us if there's any bleeding. MRI tells us more if there is a stroke happening or has, been, has started to occur. Okay, and then what happens after that? So say somebody gets admitted to the hospital, what kind of things are happening in the hospital situation for somebody who's been hospitalized for a stroke? We pay very close attention to, first of all, their, their neurological status, their mental status. Are they able to interact with us? What's their neurological exam? Are they not moving or moving very well, one side of the body versus the other one? Another thing is their vital signs. Frequently, uh, stroke causes some very characteristic changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and those are things that have to be controlled pretty tightly because it's a fine balance. If you drop the blood pressure too low in a stroke patient, you lose blood flow to what brain tissue is still viable. Whereas if it goes too high, you have an increased risk of bleeding, and then it can get into an even more desperate situation. So, so let me ask this question. Dr. McCoy, so say somebody's in the hospital, we'll kind of take this imaginary person. You know, from your end, from a neurology end, uh, what are you doing from your perspective in helping manage this patient? Yep, so let's say somebody comes in via ambulance or just simply comes into the emergency room, um, and they report symptoms that we interpret to be potentially consistent with stroke. Um, we, most hospitals, Loyola Hospital, Edward Hospital, uh, you have a tr acute stroke teams and acute stroke protocols. Those patients are immediately taken to CT scan. Uh, in, in most um, stroke centers uh, here in the Chicagoland area, if you report stroke-like symptoms, and you may not know you're having a stroke, it's our job to try to identify that, you're, you will very likely be in a CT scanner within five to 10 minutes. It is immediately fast tracked. Wow. Um, so typical door to scanner time is anywhere, again, five to 10 minutes. Well, lab work, as Dr. Spencer mentioned, is done immediately. Uh, a decision is made, number one, do we think there's a stroke? And can this individual receive TPA or another intervention? And we ideally will have that all done within about 60 minutes or less. 
Um, so it, it, if we think you had a stroke, we everybody moves fast. Can you explain to the words TPA? Can you yep. explain that medication for people? Yep. So TPA um, is, is the name for tissue plasminogen activator. It's a, a medication sometimes referred to as a, a stroke buster. It is a medication uh, in stroke. There's a stoppage in blood flow to part of the brain. And the role of TPA is to try to open up that, that blockage by dissolving a blood clot that has formed. Um, so it is a medication that can be given within the first few hours of stroke. When we talk about the critical importance of time, that's the big reason. This medication can only be used for about three to four and a half hours. There are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, you, you've got a pretty narrow time window. Uh, I, this medication can be dramatically effective. Like any medication, it's not perfect. There are some side effects from it uh, that has to be discussed very carefully at the time it's given. But uh, if, if someone's had a stroke, that's one of their best chances to, to resolve the situation. And again, there is a very narrow time window to give that medication. After a certain number of hours, the medication can no longer be given because the risk is too high. Um, and that, that was our window of opportunity. Excellent. You know, let's talk about a little bit about what's been going on in pop culture recently. We've had uh, some celebrities that have died at young ages from stroke. Uh, you look at Luke Perry, um, <clears throat> uh, was one celebrity, there was a director, I'm just blanking his name, John Singleton, uh, who directed some movies, and these are men in their early 50s that have died from, well, at least what's been reported, a stroke. You know, you know, we mentioned earlier at the beginning, stroke does not discriminate. You know, how can we, you know, we see some of that, and, hope, and sometimes when things happen, even though we didn't necessarily know those people, that, that can actually start a movement of better engagement. So let me ask Dr. Spencer this question. You know, you, we hear that kind of stuff. You know, something's going on, and then sometimes action, when you hear something happen, it causes you to kind of look at yourself a little bit more. How can, you know, we could take sometimes what's perceived as a tragic moment and turn something to that into a positive for us as people when it comes to stroke? I think it all goes back to kind of the underlying message here, Mark. It's prevention and education and just being aware of your risk. No matter how robust of a person you think you are, a quarter of strokes happen to people under the age of 65, so we're all at risk. You hear about the people. There's a number of conditions that affect young people. Pregnancy is one of them that increases your clotting risk. There's people such as marathon runners that have been reported at 30 years of age that have a devastating stroke. So I think we all have to be aware and just to, we can't think that we're invincible. We have to take care of ourselves and hydration. You have to be aware of the conditions that you have. And, uh, and take it seriously, because it's not just a disease of the old elderly population. Yeah, I think that's been, when I, when I kind of heard some of this news, and you see it again, and, and it's like, hey, this is not something that is, as you just said, Dr. Spencer, something that affects old people. We have to be more comfortable talking about this. And the reality is, a lot of times, we don't, we're not as comfortable talking about health. That's why we're trying to do things like this today on the show, and talk this, keep this conversation going, and National Stroke Awareness Month to keep the conversation going because we have to be comfortable talking about this. If we don't, then more things are going to happen. We're never going to move that needle. Um, and the reality is you just totally debunked the, debunked the, you know, it's a myth, but you totally debunked it that, that even people that are perceived to be healthy may certainly have that risk. You mentioned marathon runners, things like that. Uh, Dr. McCoy, uh, can stroke happen even in the young, you know, even, even younger than like 18 or the 30-year-olds or things like that? Do, you, do we see it? across the spectrum, across the lifespan? It can. So uh, patients who are older are, have a higher risk for stroke, and some of those risk factors are modifiable, some of them are not. But we certainly see stroke in, in very, very young ages. Fortunately, it's more rare, but pediatric stroke is well documented. Uh, you see it in a number of our centers. Um, there can be strokes at very, very early ages of life. So it, it's fortunately not as common. Um, however, it can absolutely occur. Yeah. What about, you know, I want to get into a little bit, one of the things when we talked about last time you guys were on the show, we talked about trying to make sure that, that people have the resources to deal with certain medical challenges. And we know that, obviously, not all communities are saving the equipment resources. You know, what do we do for people that, communities that don't have the, uh, the robust resources to, to handle stroke? I think about uh, rural communities uh, or sometimes various inner city communities where they don't have the infrastructure that we have at the academic university or out in the suburbs where we're at, Dr. Spencer and I, and, you know, how do we even the playing field and make sure people in those communities have the resources? I'll ask that question first to Dr. McCoy, and then Dr. Spencer can chime in afterwards. Yeah, so uh, the, as you've mentioned, the most important resource we have is prevention. Um, so it, it's, it's working strongly with folks to look at healthy eating, um, moderate exercise can be beneficial, eliminating risk factors, particularly things like cigarette smoking, which is clearly a risk factor. Um, as, as much as we have um, kind of neat tools to try to offset stroke, none of them are as effective as preventing stroke. 
and and I recognize in, in certain communities it can be harder to get access that uh, there are restrictions in terms of financial access for dietary health exercise etc but that really can be a major focus and there's a benefit both at the local and national level to prevention because if someone's had a stroke the potential impact on them their family their quality of life is devastating so prevention is really the absolute key. So, Dr. Spencer, your thought on communities that may have a little bit of a disadvantage from a resource standpoint to handle stroke? Unfortunately, I think those communities are actually becoming at bigger risk because you're seeing the centralization of healthcare. You're seeing the bigger centers take over. You're seeing people that, that are suburbs are the smallest hospitals you see. When you get further out in the more remote areas, sure, they have some of the capabilities to treat stroke, but not the same ones that you do in more urban centers. And I think just the way economical stresses as you're seeing those small towns get smaller and I think that's going to have to be a big focus in the future otherwise those populations just aren't going to exist or they're going to be at serious risk. You know one of the things I think about and my wife and I did a recent drive down to uh, down to Georgia uh, for spring break uh, back in the end of March and as we're driving through a lot of the Midwest and the farmland and stuff as a physician I always think about you know what resources are here and you know, you know, here where we're at, we can dial 911, activate emergency medical services, and within two to three minutes, you know, you got an ambulance at your door. And uh, sometimes even faster than that. And you know, but I think about, I couldn't help but think about, and when you're out of those communities, when you dial EMS, or, or is that service going to get there in that kind of time frame? My my gut, of course, would say no. But 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 this is why we need to have more resources poured into some of these communities that deal with the same disease burden that we deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just I know it's a problem that we're going to try to solve. Uh, any use at all from tech from technology, uh, Dr. McCoy? We think about telemedicine or or maybe smaller hospitals talking with experts at larger hospitals when they deal with cases like this or stroke. Yeah, absolutely. So so uh, telemedicine or teleneurology, tele stroke services are a way to offset some of these distance issues uh, that that have been brought up. Um, you can only have so many experts, uh, and, and they tend to be somewhat localized. Um, uh, teleneurology has been, I think, will be a, a huge advantage. So the idea would be someone would maybe has stroke symptoms, they go to their local emergency room. Um, where there's a local emergency room physician, there may not be a local neurologist. Yeah. Or that local neurologist may be three or four hours away, realistically. Um, if they are connected to a teleneurology network, uh, there's actually a robot that can be directed by a physician at another center. Uh, where they can talk to the patient through uh, uh, a camera. They can potentially get some examination in with the patient with the help of a nurse. They can look at the CT imaging, and that physician can make a decision remotely as to whether or not someone has possibly had a stroke and then could give them that medication TPA that I mentioned, and then make a decision after the drug's been given, do we keep the patient there at the local hospital or do we potentially transfer that patient to a higher care center? Uh, as we look across the United States and broader boundaries, uh, the ability to provide that kind of care through uh, telemedicine uses has a great deal of potential. Uh, there is a shortage of physicians, there's certainly a shortage of neurologists nationally. Um, we are significantly under the number of neurologists we need, which is probably good for my job security. Um, but the ability to reach out to patients over long distances is absolutely something we can do. Those networks are starting to become more robust and developed. Uh, at uh, our medical center, we are part of a tele-stroke network that connects, I think, somewhere in the range of 20 hospitals. Um, so it, it's, it's a fascinating use of the technology that can really provide care far beyond the, the reach of our walls. Well, that's wonderful. And now you're start, starting to create equity again across the, across the service line. You know, Dr. Spencer, I think about your role as a neurosurgeon and, um, and kind of doing this kind of tech. You know, obviously, you know, if there is a connection from a neurosurgeon or there's a case that might be identified that that we need to, you need to take intervention in something remote, uh, obviously they would be transferring that person, uh, maybe via helicopter, uh, to your to your facility so you can actually do something about that. Uh, what's, where do you see kind of neurosurgery uh, in this whole kind of spectrum when I think about using technology, um, working with people that might be remote, and then bringing them into you? How do you kind of, how do you kind of see neurosurgery fitting into this? I think we have a lot of tools in place already. I think... <clears throat> The, the telemedicine that Matt kind of talked about, and that's a way for us to be at least stratify which patients are probably more appropriate to come to us. If there's better communication along those lines, we can see scans, we can hear patient scenarios, and just being experienced, we know which patients should probably be funneled our way, and I think most of us are pretty reasonable about that, and if anybody reaches out, we're more than available. I think there have to be more of that in using our technology to get to the right place. 
I want to ask you a final question. You know, we mentioned, uh, and we, maybe we should break this down a little bit because we haven't broken it down for people yet. So we asked this question to Dr. McCoy. Uh, what are the various kinds of strokes so people might understand, like when a doctor talks to them about, hey, you have this kind of stroke or that kind of stroke or this kind of stroke, is, this, is it classified in subtypes? Yeah, I would say probably the two biggest breakdowns are ischemic stroke, which is a stroke where there's a stoppage in blood flow to a certain part of the brain, but no bleeding, and a hemorrhagic stroke where the blood vessels open up or become friable, and there, there's actually blood product that we can see in the brain on a CT scan. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Spencer, if there is bleeding, is that when you come in uh, from, your, from your perspective, from a neurosurgical standpoint? We're typically notified of every case, no matter the amount okay. of blood. Uh, we're, typically, we're notified if there is any blood whatsoever in the brain tissue itself, which means the brain tissue at one point often can change. It can often induce more swelling than the stroke itself. So it's something we have to watch pretty closely because, that, again, that window of time. Okay, and then I want to ask you one more question related to that. So say there is a significant amount of bleeding in the brain, um, is it always a neurosurgical intervention? Is, is, is surgery looking like in that person's future, or are there other ways to kind of monitor things without actually having to uh, go under the knife, so to speak? So it's like Dr. McCoy alluded to earlier, so that it doesn't necessarily depend as much on the size of the hemorrhage or where it's at. It's more the location. There are certain locations that are immediate threat to life, and there are certain locations where a hemorrhage, unfortunately, has taken some of that brain tissue. We can't really reverse that, but if it swells, if it continues to get larger, it puts pressure on some of the more important areas of the brain then it becomes more of a, a critical intervention to save what brain tissue is left. I value. So, Dr. McCoy, we didn't break down another kind of, what I kind of call, uh, uh, an extra subcategory stroke, many strokes, the transient ischemic attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that? Because, you know, it's interesting, I'll talk to, I'll get history from people, and they, you know, when you see, meet a new person, they'll say, oh, I ask them, hey, what's your family history like? Is there a family history of stroke or anything? Of, heart disease or anything like that, they'll be like, oh yeah, my grandma had a mini stroke. And you know, people use that term very, mm -hmm. it's very common, but, but, but sometimes we may not truly know what happened. But why don't you break that down for us? So uh, a, a TIA, <laughs> TIA or transient ischemic attack, um, I, I've heard people refer to it as a mini stroke. I refer to it as a missed stroke. So it's someone who has stroke symptoms. There's probably a stoppage in blood flow to part of the brain. Symptoms typically last about five to 15 minutes, and then they resolve. Um, that is a major warning sign that someone's at risk for a stroke. Uh, in the past, we used to say it was less than 24 hours of symptoms. You know, with modern MRI technology, really looks like somebody's symptoms typically are about 5 to 15 mm -hmm. minutes. Um, that's a major warning sign. If somebody, the most classic uh, patient will come in and say, I was at home, and all of a sudden I lost vision in my left eye. It was like someone pulled a lampshade over my eye. It lasted 5, 10 minutes and then resolved. I'm very concerned about that patient. They, they have had a stroke. They're just very fortunate their body was able to clear it quickly. Uh, they're at a high risk for a stroke in the next 24, 48, 72 hours. They should absolutely contact the primary care doctor. They could consider going to an emergency room. Uh, that's someone who's at very high risk for a stroke. They just are lucky the stroke broke up on its own. Well, and you know, I feel like people kind of pat blow that off. And obviously, as we're talking about today, I love how you said it, missed opportunity, missed stroke. <laughs> And we have to take that seriously because, it's, again, as you said earlier, you were talking about, oh, I feel so good, I'm going to go to sleep. And then you might have missed that one opportunity. You know, this is one of the things that we have to talk about. And I know that's one of the key things when we're talking about National Stroke Awareness Month, that, that, that we don't want to miss that kind of stuff. And so the risk after that is quite high, as you said. That's correct. Uh, there is a substantial risk in the 24 to 48 hours following a TIA that the, the next one will not be transient, it will be permanent. Mm, 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 mm. So, you know, here we are talking today, guys, and by the way, you're listening here live on Facebook, we're watching as well, too, in the studio here at intellectualradio.com, we're talking about stroke and the importance of that, we really need to create the awareness. And the foundation, of course, sets, sets in when we're talking about laying out the lifestyle measures. You know, if you have diabetes, if you have obesity, if you have high blood pressure, if you're a smoker, we have to get those factors under control. We have to eliminate those things that are contributing to the risk. Because at the end of the day, we want everybody to be healthy. When I'm sitting here talking with Dr. McCoy and Dr. Dr. Spencer, they want you to be healthy. They don't necessarily want you to see them. They want you, but they're here for you if you need to see them. But we want to make sure we lay down the thing, lay down the, down the foundation. And it's interesting, um, and I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, CDC has said in the past that if we do the things that we're supposed to be doing in our lifestyle, we can present, we can prevent so many, so many chronic diseases. The reality, I don't remember the actual percentage, but we're talking about lo lower heart disease risk, lower diabetes, lower obesity, lower cancer risk. Across the board, you can do that with healthy lifestyles. So the important thing is that I think for you out uh, there who's listening, um, you know, ask yourself what you want to do. You know, as far as getting healthy, as far as getting your health back in check. First, first and foremost, for me as a primary care physician, 
come in and get your physical. Come in and get checked. If you haven't seen your doctor in more than a year uh, for some baseline assessments, a blood pressure check, a blood sugar check, just to check your body weight, just to check how you're moving and everything like that, if you haven't done that in more than a year, it's time to get that done right now. And that's where I come in and make sure that we lay out a good strategy for you. And again, and the, we want to make sure that you minimize your risk for something that can be very, very challenging. I want to ask Dr. McCoy this. I'll come back at you in a question. We're talking about the impact. And as you mentioned earlier, stroke not only impacts somebody's, the, the individual patient, but it can have a tremendous impact on their families, their functionality, their employment, and things like that. We all have had those stories of patients that have come through our door where they might have been the breadwinner in the family. They have kids in high school or junior high. They get hit with a stroke at age 50, and now you know the, the, the money dries up, they're on chronic to permanent disability. You know, we have to have this kind of conversation. So talk about what people should really be doing that, you know, stroke just affects so much more. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? In terms of what are some of the long-term impacts? Yeah, some of the long-term impacts. Yeah, so it, it, you guys, it's going to depend a lot on where the stroke occurs. If someone's had a stroke, and we, we've gone through the first maybe 24, 48 hours, uh, where the high risk period is starting to subside, maybe 96 hours or so, um, we're then going to see what are the symptoms somebody has. Uh, following their stroke, the initial assessments, but well, what can we do to get recovery? Uh, that usually that's going to be physical therapy. Oftentimes it's inpatient physical therapy, followed by home outpatient physical therapy. Um, usually after about a year is when we see that, that all of the recovery that will occur has occurred. Um, my experience is some patients get near complete recovery from stroke, but many patients get limited or no recovery from stroke. And then it depends on what the symptoms are. Uh, for some people, uh, they, their symptoms are significant enough that they cannot work again. Uh, they may not be able to walk without using a walker or having a leg brace or potentially using a uh, cane. Um, if it's in the right part of the brain, there's other symptoms that may, may become involved. So uh, an individual who's had a stroke can become completely dependent on someone else for their care. Um, uh, some folks can't go home, they have to reside in long-term care facilities because their ability to swallow has been affected. Um, so a, a stroke can be absolutely devastating, and while it, it may not uh, kill someone, it can certainly significantly alter their ability to live. Yeah, the number one cause certainly of, of, of significant disability in this country, without a doubt. You know, Dr. Spencer, you've, you've dealt with families before, you've seen the devastating effects of stroke. How do you, how do you approach how do you have that conversation? Because the reality is, as, as people, we're humans, we feel, and, and one of the things that we talk about, on, on, on one of the things that I like doing this and, and getting in kind of your guys' brains, you know, it brings a human factor to it. And I think that's one of the things about a lot of people may have a perception of physicians, that physicians may not understand them, but we're people too. We feel that's, that's innate for us. But how do we have those kind of conversations to say, you know, hey, Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones, you know, your loved one has suffered a significant injury and, and the chance of recovery may be slim. How do we, how do we kind of better have those kind of conversations with people? Sure, sure. And, you know, it's not one of the more enjoyable parts of my job. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I see some of, the, some of the worst case scenarios where you have to really think about what the person wants, too. It never gets any easier to have the conversation, but I think you have to start with, you know, like we talked about before, you have to look at the area of the stroke. You have to have, as a physician, knowing what you know, having your experience, thinking about what this means long term. And it, with my experience, I found that the best approach, for better or worse, for better or worse, is just being brutally honest. Some people react to it differently. You have to have some, you have to have some tact when you say that too. But I think setting, giving people realistic expectations from the front, you have to tell them based on your opinion what you realistically expect. And if that's complete devastation, you have to tell them that and let them process it. Because we all know people go through the different stages of grieving, different stages of processing this information. But I think the more honest with them you are at the first moment you meet them, it gets them through that process faster and really assessing what they want, what their loved one wants, and how you go about treatment, and it helps them start planning sooner. Excellent. You know, I recently did a show a few weeks ago about occupational therapists, and I think when it comes to stroke, the role of occupational therapists is, is so crucial. Dr. McCoy, why don't you explain a little bit about some of the relationship that you have with some of our, our allied health professionals and to, to try to have a meaningful um, restoration of quality of life in stroke sure. victims? Yeah, so I feel like our, our role as a neurologist is, number one, did you have a stroke? If you did, what can we do to try to reverse it immediately? Then in the immediate aftermath, what can we do to limit the damage? Uh, and from there, it's really saying, listen, now is the time to work with the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, to try to help maximize recovery. Uh, the, the brain is able to recover. Um, there is some plasticity to the brain where, where the more you use uh, the brain and more you use certain structures, the better they will recover. 
And that's where I feel as a physician, listen, my role is to just get you connected with the physical therapist. Uh, there's, th you know, having the opportunity to work here in Chicago for a long time, there's a, a number of just tremendous physical and occupational therapists. Um, and my role as a neurologist then becomes just meeting with people periodically to say, well, you, know, you had your stroke six months ago, let's make sure that your risk factors are well controlled, how's your cholesterol, your blood sugar, have you stopped smoking, are you taking aspirin, uh, what do you do with the physical therapist? And is there more stuff we can do? Uh, the, the more active people are after their stroke, the more likely they are to get recovery. And I, I recognize it's a simple thing to say, for some people that activity is the challenge, and that's where the therapists are really the absolutely essential bedrock of the treatment plan. Yeah. I always talk about therapists, and when I did the show a few weeks ago with uh, occupational therapists, and I've had a physical therapy show as well too, and it's just like, they are, they are so good at what they do, and, and, and it gives me comfort as a physician to say, hey, you know, yes, we have the diagnosis, but I know people that truly can help. They, they will truly fight for you to the end and make sure that you have dignity, make sure you have quality of life, and give you as much restoration of function as possible. And so I would say, like, they're unheralded heroes, and they need to be recognized more on what they do. So it's just amazing. So I want to do this. <clears throat> I want to ask a few more questions, then we're going to get into my Miss versus Facts. So uh, I want to, you know, when it comes to, like, stroke, you know, you know, one of the things, as, as you said, Dr. Spencer, one of the things you got to do is just be brutally honest with people. We have to tell them that. But, but I do believe that, that, that as you're being honest with people and being truthful with them, you know, they will understand uh, what's going on, and certainly from their treatment plan. And you mentioned, Dr. McCoy, a few moments ago that, that yeah, when you come, they come back and see you in the clinic, you know, they, you know, you're continuing to encourage them as well, too. Let's just talk a little bit about, um, about the post-op. Post uh, our post-hospitalization course. Again, we're taking people through like things to expect. When they, we've talked about when you go to the emergency room, what to expect in the hospital. We're touching right now a little bit on like the post-recovery. From a neurosurgical standpoint, when you're seeing people po uh, post-surgery, for example, you had to do an intervention, what are some of the things that you're looking for after a procedure? So immediately you're looking for stable or better neurological status. All right? Any imaging, you're seeing if there's been any additional damage, if you stop the process that you go in to stop. And from there on, you see, is there anything else that you can do from a surgical standpoint, or have you maximized their potential for recovery? And then it's the course of, again, like getting them stable, getting them out of the hospital, like Dr. McCoy said, getting them to the most important people that never get the recognition, yeah. the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, <laughs> that are incredibly you know, resilient people that uh, see these people through the long haul. Those are the big things I look for, and then it's, again, being realistic with the family, setting time frames, like Dr. McCoy mentioned, that year out from surgery is your point of maximal, uh, your maximal recovery. And then I think my discussions with them in the office is really being able to be realistic. You have to have some common ground with them, and yes, give them hope, but at the same time, be able to say, this is not likely, this is likely, and this is what you have to be prepared for, because I think you're not doing them any favors by giving them unrealistic expectations either. Well, I'm all about the power of positivity and, and having that, that kind of interaction with your patients, and, and I trust that in my patients that I've continued to lead them through uh, um, just the possibilities and to tell them never give up when they're in their battles with any kind of health challenge. We all want people to be healthy and live their lives to the fullest uh, capabilities possible. I want to ask one more question, then we're going to get into our myths versus facts. I want to ask this, I get this question asked quite a bit. I want to ask this to Dr. McCoy. Is stroke hereditary? Do we know anything about that? So I would say for the majority of people, the answer is no. Um, majority of people, stroke is, is potentially modifiable. But yes, there are some people who potentially have hereditary risk factors that, that will increase the odds that they could have a stroke. Um, so uh, for the most part, my answer is no. But if there's a strong family history, that's one of the reasons we ask that question to patients. Is there any family history from your parents, from your brothers, from your sisters? Is, if, if there's a strong family history, there are some conditions that we could potentially diagnose and say your risk of stroke is higher than someone else's risk. Excellent. Well, thank you. Hey, so I want to get into this section now, something that we've been doing on the show for a long time now, myths versus facts. And I did it with myths versus facts when we had the concussion show with Dr. Spencer and Dr. McCoy, so I get to ask them again uh, uh, this part of the show. And so how myths versus facts works, for those of you that are new to the show, uh, I say a statement, and then our panelist says either myth or fact, and they give us a few sentences why it's a myth or a fact. But again, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, we want to make sure that we've, we're clear in the air. There's a lot of misleading information out there about health, uh, and health, a lot of times, can be very difficult to navigate. It can be frustrating at times. But when you're working with a, with, a, with a professional team, we can help you get to your goals and help set the record straight. So here it is, myth versus fact, stroke one-on-one. -on -one. First statement, here we go. This is the Dr. McCoy, myth or fact. All right. If, here's a statement, if stroke symptoms resolve after a few minutes, 
There is no need to seek medical attention. Myth. And hopefully we made this one pretty clear. If the symptoms are resolved, we're still very, very concerned. We want you, we would much rather see you and sort it out. So if it resolved, that was a big warning sign. It's time to come in. I'm going to say triple myth. I'll yeah. take your myth and raise it a couple times. Perfect. Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCoy. Here we go, Dr. Spencer. Myth or fact? Here's a statement. Strokes only happen to the elderly. That's a definite myth. All right. Please explain. We covered this earlier. There are certain strokes that we just can't predict for any reason. There are certain people with health conditions that haven't presented yet that put them at increased risk of blood clots happening, causing a stroke. And again, I'll say that 25% of strokes happen in people under the age of 65. Well, that, and that is a very powerful one. And I was trying to, I was asking that statement on purpose because I wanted to see if I can tease it out of you again because that's such a powerful number. 25% of strokes happening on people under 65. I just want to jump in quickly as a, yeah, please. just to highlight this point that it's not just older people. I have a, a friend of mine um, who is would be the picture of health, younger than I am, uh, had a stroke. Wow. Um, in fact, when I got the phone call and I said that, you know, it's I don't believe it, and then I listened to the story, and I talked to the physician, and I thought, yeah, this person, this is absolutely a stroke. Unfortunately, uh, this person recognized the symptoms, paid attention, went immediately to an emergency room, and was taken care of. So it, uh, it's, it's not just theoretical. Yeah, we all know somebody, whether the patient we care or somebody that we know through our, through our lives and everything. So thank you for clarifying that, gentlemen. All right, here we go. Dr. McCoy, here we go. Myth or fact, stroke recovery is a lifelong process. I'm going to go fact. Uh, and I would say the reason why, and I, I, I feel jaded, because last time I was on this, I think they're all myths. But I would say fact. I know, they were all myths last time. I got to set up with you guys so a little bit. I, I, mean, I would say that that one is a fact, that stroke is a lifelong recovery process. And, and the reason being just what you got to earlier, yes, there's a, a big recovery phase at the beginning. But after one year, it doesn't mean we should stop. People should remain active. They should keep paying attention. I, I would consider it to be lifelong in the sense that we are trying to reduce your risk of the next one. That's one of the ways you recover from the first one. So. I would say it's lifelong in that smoking should remain. Uh, you should quit smoking lifelong. You should look at diet. You should look at exercise. You should look at these things that should continue well after the stroke that you've had. So your stroke care doesn't end 365 days after your stroke. All right, here we go. If I could comment on oh, that. Yeah, please go right ahead. Quickly. So I know we mentioned earlier the point of maximum recovery is that year after the event. But we tell this to surgery patients too. Yes, that's the point of most rapid recovery, but there's a lot of things that can happen after that, too. Matt mentioned plasticity earlier. There's other things you can learn. Just being more aware of your deficits and with experience over time, you can get better at dealing with that. So certainly the year is not the end. All right, thank you. Here we go. Uh, here we go, Dr. Spitz. Here's a statement. Strokes are painful. Myth. All right, please explain. This pain is one of the least frequent uh, symptoms of a stroke, and, and Matt would agree with this. So yep. most people have neurological symptoms with no pain. I would say only under circumstances where, say you do have a hemorrhagic stroke or you have severe swelling of the brain, it can irritate the tissues around the brain, and that's where it can cause pain or headaches. But I think, Or if you have a fall from your stroke and have a distracting injury, but I think rarely are they painful. Excellent. You know what? I think I want to participate in this a little bit. I don't think I participated last time when we did the concussion show. So here we go. I'm going to get on this too. Here we go. Here's a statement. I like this. Why not? Here we go. Myth or fact? Here's a statement. Uh, when you experience stroke symptoms, you should go to your family doctor ASAP. That is a big fat myth. You need to go to the emergency room ASAP, activate 911, call emergency medical services, and go to the emergency room. Your primary care physician is not equipped to handle an acute stroke symptom. Yeah. There we go. I like it. Here we go. Here we go. Dr. McCoy, here's the next statement. All right. F family history of stroke increases your chance of stroke. I, I would say it's certainly something that could increase your risk of stroke, so I'm going to go fact. Okay. Um, if there is a very strong family history, uh, it's something we should certainly pay attention to. Maybe the reason you have a strong family history of stroke is maybe you have a strong family history of hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol. Maybe you are genetically susceptible to the risk factors for stroke or for stroke itself. So uh, paying attention to your family history is a good idea. Um, and, and recognizing that if there's a strong family history, we really may better pay attention to the modifiable risk factors. Excellent. Here we go, Dr. Spencer. Here's your statement. Small strokes do not need to be treated. Myth. All right, please explain. So as we've discussed a couple different times, so small strokes, and I think TIA falls under that category, they can be a harbinger of much, much worse things to come. And also some of the smallest strokes, if placed correctly, can be some of the most devastating. All right, thank you. Here we go, Dr. McCoy. Stroke is a disease of the heart. That's a pseudo myth. Pseudo myth. Okay. Fair uh, enough. You know, it, stroke is a is a brain problem uh, that can come from multiple places. But certainly, someone who has heart disease, the 
If there's problems with the heart, the brain can potentially suffer. As a neurologist, I would say the role of the heart is to provide the brain with blood and oxygen. So if there's a heart problem, atrial fibrillation has been mentioned, coronary artery disease, those are risk factors for the blood vessels in the brain. So individuals who have heart risk factors also have brain risk factors. All right, thank you. You know what, and I told you, I probably should have asked myself that question because I said I was going to participate with you guys. So, so here we go, I get the next one myself. Here we go. Uh, here's a statement and I'm going to give my answer. Up to 80% of strokes are preventable. I will say that's a fact. We're talking about lifestyle at the end of the day and lifestyle being one of the biggest reasons uh, for, people, for people getting themselves into strokes. If we modify, if we reduce the modified risk factors, including reduction in smoking, eliminating smoking, I shouldn't say reduction, eliminating completely, uh, uh, controlling diabetes, making sure blood pressure is controlled, uh, make sure body weight is controlled, uh, moving more, eating better, and stressing less, I think we can actually do a lot of good good movement and momentum in preventing stroke. All right, we're gonna do one more, here we go. Dr. Spencer, this one's for you. I like this one. Okay, at best, taking aspirin will do nothing to cure an ischemic stroke. At worst, it will make things worse during a hemorrhagic stroke. I'm gonna to aspirin. I'm going to have to say <laughs> there's some, some truth to that. Uh, and it, it, it's one of the points that, yeah, I'm glad we touched on because it is purely ischemic stroke. It probably isn't going to hurt anything. Honestly, in a hemorrhagic stroke, an aspirin, even in, especially in 81, it's not a huge risk to cause a hemorrhagic stroke to get worse. It usually will compo uh, contribute a trivial amount to that, something more as plavix is much more potent. That's something you probably don't want to give in a hemorrhagic situation. All right. You have any comment so, on that one? So, and, and this is going to be more of an inside joke for... Yeah. Uh, one of my former residents, Karen, who's at the University of Colorado, and Jorge, who's not at the University of Chicago, aspirin is always the answer. Uh, whenever you take a stroke lecture, aspirin is always the right answer, even if it's maybe not, but they'll appreciate that. <laughs> whenever I go to stroke conferences, there's lots of discussion, and in the end, you're like, well, you do give the patient aspirin. So yeah. aspirin is a benefit for most strokes. All right, thank you. There you guys have it, myths versus facts. All right. So we got about five minutes left, and we've been talking about just laying down the foundation and creating more engagement and awareness of stroke and making sure that this conversation today does not end here today to make sure that this conversation is part of a daily conversation because we can all do better to uplift each other to make Make sure that our risk for stroke are kept to a minimum. So uh, I want to bring it on home. So I'm going to ask Dr. Spencer first. Give us a few take-home points when it comes to people being more aware and why it's important for people to be aware about of stroke. Again, it all comes back to prevention. The first one and two takeaway points would be prevention. And again, you have to be honest with yourself. And if we haven't laid it out clearly, this is one of the most devastating, if not the most devastating disease. I mean, the, the ones that you survive are actually more devastating than people that don't survive a stroke. The long-term cost of that, the long-term effect on your family, which I don't think we even had time to get into today, but that takes a huge toll socially on everybody in your family, so preventing it, doing whatever you can. There are some cases we won't be able to prevent, and that's where it comes. the time comes in. Then the other thing is just making people comfortable to say, if you see something, say something, don't go to sleep, don't see how it is in the morning, be comfortable, even if everything checks out okay, it's not worth the long-term effect. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show again. I look forward to collaborating with you in the future as well, too. Thanks, Dr. Spencer. Thank Dr. You. McCoy, give us a couple take-home points about what people should know, why it's important to have this conversation that we're having about stroke. Yep. To me, the big thing is pay attention to the symptoms and be aware of the time. Um, prevention is absolutely the thing to do, so, so meeting with your primary care physician, taking a proactive stance when it comes to diet, exercise, uh, minimizing alcohol use, complete avoidance of, of cigarette smoking. My hope is that you never have to meet me and you particularly never have to meet me in the emergency room. Uh, pay attention to your symptoms, and if you, have, if you have concern for stroke, any concern, time is of the essence. Uh, to steal from one of my colleagues, Camilo Gomez, time is brain. And the longer you wait, the more likely there is to be irreversible brain damage. We have a window of opportunity to treat uh, patients with stroke, and that window is small. So pay attention to the symptoms, pay attention to the time, and get yourself in as quickly as possible. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. McCoy. It's been yeah. a pleasure having you on the show again. I'm looking forward to do some more collaboration. i got more ideas, my friends. Perfect. That's uh, great. Things that will go up your alley for both of you gentlemen. But thank you again for taking time, both of you guys, for coming, taking time on your busy schedule and to come in and help me spread a message today. So this is not none of this is possible without your guys' contribution. So thank you very much. And my final thoughts are this. You know, we're talking about, again, trying to move the needle. You know, we have to decide what we want to do with our own health. Take your health. You have your destiny. Decide what you want to do, but also talk about why you want to do it. I want to know why. I want to hear your story. And then when we figure out the what and why you're trying to do things without your health, we can talk about the how. 
And the first thing that I always keep saying is like, number one, establish a relationship with your primary care physician. Now, these gentlemen here today will certainly say that as well too. Let's talk about things that we can do versus things that we can't do. Let's focus on the positives. And hopefully at the end of the day, we continue to move the needle and making sure that we stay healthy together. So again, you guys have been listening. I want to thank my guest today. We got Dr. Drew Spencer, board, board eligible neurosurgeon with Edward Elmer's Health. Check him out at www.eehealth.org. Dr. Matthew McCoy, board certified neurologist, associate professor, and residency program director of neurology at Loyola Medicine. Check him out at www.loyolamedicine.org. You've been watching and listening live on Facebook at intellectualradio.com. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producer is Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Music is by the one for Mr. Havis, copyright 2019 by MDG Wellness LLC, all rights reserved. Stay tuned for my next episode. The title is Emergency Medical Services Week. If you enjoyed today's show, please be sure to like it and share it on social media. Audio replay is available on your favorite podcasting app. Simply search for To Your Health with Dr. G. Subscribe and press play. Don't forget to check out my e-commerce store on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com to get some awesome To Your Health with Dr. G swag. Let's keep this health revolution going strong. See you next time, guys. Peace out. <laughs>